character. So, hello, everybody. Um, if you agree, eh? If you push the button, you agree with it, yes. Yes, because okay. it's a legal uh, meeting, eh? This one. Yeah, it's a legal meeting. Okay, thank you, Rob Pereira. Everybody <laughs> who is present, I will uh, give notice on my presentation in a minute, but uh, this meeting will be recorded and will be published on our Broadcasting ADSD Europe uh, channel on YouTube. So I am Hans van der Velde. I'm here as uh, Vice President of ADSD Europe, but also as the Chair of the Dutch Science Committee of the Dutch Association for People with ADSD and Dyslexia. And um, I will do the kickoff, Miriam, if you're okay, with the, let's say, the Dutch situation. And here it is. I will inform you about our experiences of the last years. So this meeting will be recorded, as I said, and it will be published. And here is my update. Well, it happens that the last week, something really legally interesting happened. Medice, a pharmaceutical, wrote a, well, a kind of threatening, for us it was threatening email, to the Dutch Association in Bills and Wordblind, that we have to remove certain information we published on the website about <coughs> recall free dex, dexamphetamine, which is not as expensive as the one that Medici is selling. It's a complicated story, never mind. But it's information mentioning a certain medication, in this case, dexamphetamine. And they say this is advertising and it's prohibited, etc. Whoa, everybody frightened. So is this information or is it advertising? I, uh, since I have a legal background, that's why I participate in this uh, meeting, I uh, looked it up and I saw the European guidelines. Yeah, or Otto, um, shut up yeah. off, um, Herr Bau. I saw the European guidelines and um, there is indeed regulation about making uh, advertisement about medications. And what I saw is that if you mention the medical product, indirect or direct, the European regulation says that the national government has to decide about that. And the Dutch legislator, the government, has not adapted a certain paragraph because, and here is what the Dutch government says, says in, uh, and the, the Dutch uh, Court of Justice has, has also ruled like this, that it's when it's evidently informing the public, in our case, patients, this will be evident that it's not advertising, but it's information. So the conclusion is that for you, for other countries, please check what your local national government has decided about this paragraph four, article one of the EU guideline. So that's uh, one thing that happened lately. <coughs> uh, the other thing that's already a few years ago, um, we were wondering, um, uh, we, we, we started uh, to have contact with the Dutch Institute for Human Rights especially about anti-discrimination legislation. That's quite an interesting subject because discrimination can be in all kinds of territories, at work, with insurers, etc. And uh, the Dutch, in the Netherlands, I don't know in other countries, would be interesting to hear that from you. If you have an institute, a governmental institute for human rights and, and anti-discrimination, in the Netherlands, we have, and in 2018, there was a ruling that a certain employer discriminated against a man by failing to sufficiently investigate an effective adjustment for his ADHD and his chronic sleeping problems, and then terminated the employer employment relationship with him. So here, the, the, the employer was accused and uh, uh, sort of convicted of discrimination. So that's for 
our community, that's positive because you have something to refer to in the Netherlands. But in other cases, there were also, there was a ruling in 2011. That's always the case when you talk legally, you have to prove what you think. Only having an opinion is not enough. You have to prove what's the matter. And in this case, an employee didn't prove that the employer discriminated him. It was an ambulance driver, typically for ADHD. And uh, what is especially interesting is this, that the employer said, and that's something really to realize, the fact that the applicant, uh, that's uh, the employee, has ADHD played no role, said the employer officially. However, the applicant's failure to inform the employer in time about his ADHD has the proverbial has been the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. So there were other issues, and then moreover, he didn't share his ADHD, and then they say that was what breached our our uh, our confidence with the employee. So that is something to consider when you advise people about coming out or not coming out about your ADHD. Because if you don't give, as an employee, you don't give disclosure, that means you cannot rightfully claim adjustments or uh, claim your protective rights, because if they don't know you have ADHD, it's hard to discriminate you on it. I'm interested what people think about it. So uh, for the Dutch situation again, I can tell you because in daily life I work as a coach. I coach employees for employers. And I know that HR and management are more and more really open to, uh, to, to people with ADHD and to discuss, let's say, uh, adjustments, reasonable adjustments or accommodations, whatever you call it. And they also see that uh, if a person is open about his or her ADHD, that we can also work on the advantages of ADHD and get people in the right place. So more and more in the Netherlands, not every employer, but more and more employers really understand, hey, these people with ADHD, they might be very useful for the organization. And if we have some small adjustments, they can flourish. So. That's the status of the Netherlands at the moment. Uh, another example is that about uh, insurance discrimination. We, that's a model of competitors, I could say. Rob Pereira, who is also present in this meeting, and I, we guide, coach students with their end thesis most of the time. And one that did a Bachelor of Law has digged into insurance companies and at least made, made a good publication for, on, for us that private, private insurances uh, in the Netherlands have the freedom to accept or not to accept someone for an insurance. In this case, concerning ADSD, you're talking about life insurance and occupational incapacity insurance for the self-employed. So if you are self-employed and you get ill for a longer time, you want to uh, uh, insure your income. And it, will, it became clear that some insurers, private insurers, uh, impose a higher premium when ADHD or sometimes even refuse them. So that's still, we are still working on that. And uh, she also looked into, is this legally okay that there is a distinction between neurotypicals and people with ADHD in insurance matters, because making a distinction is not prohibited. Discrimination is to make a prohibited this distinction, and that must be based on objectively justified reasons. And until now, what we have been digging into, there is no objectively justifiable reason to distinct purely on ADHD for an insurance. So what to do about it? She made this student, she also made recommendations for our association, Impulse and Word Blind. And her recommendation was try to lobby with the union of insurers, which, which we already did, 
of course, try to influence your members of parliament to make good legislation and, and convince insurers to collaborate with coaches for prevention of illness, etc. So another legal uh, uh, thing, well, it's between legislation and practice. If you use the word reasonable accommodations, that's what I noticed working in the Netherlands. If you use the word reasonable adjustments or reasonable accommodations, you already inflict the brain of the, the person who's listening to you with, hmm, are these adjustments reasonable? And before you know it, you're in court and having trouble and having a legal conflict. So what I promote is the word useful adjustments. When I talk to an employer together with an employee whom I, whom I am coaching, I always use the word useful adjustment. So then the discussion is, is this adjustment useful? Of course, it's reasonable. Nobody's going to ask something unreasonable. That would be kind of silly, you know? So the, um, I promote the word useful adjustments. When we're talking legally, we of course know that, uh, that reasonable adjustment has a legal uh, basis. So for example, useful adjustments, what we are talking about in the Netherlands is this in, in a large open office, you can use these shields of uh, a wall of plants. And I know in the Netherlands, at least employers are absolutely willing to talk about that. And what is also quite accepted in the Netherlands, and then I can stop my talk, otherwise it will be too long, that all these kind of accommodations or, well, little things you can organize for a person with, for an employee with ADHD. In fact, I have several cases where they are really open to, let's say, uh, organizing a buddy, a colleague who talks to you half an hour per week, or change the, the job a little that persons go out and do, let's say, account management or travel to accounts to the customer of the organization. Uh, let's not go into the coaching part and what, what accommodations all are possible. But uh, what I wanted to report to you is that it, it's quite well, not absolutely fantastic, but it's quite well accepted in the Netherlands. So hopefully later on, we have time to discuss a bit about this. Thank you. This was my update from the Netherlands. Thanks, Hans. I would now go ahead and tell you a little bit about Germany. Those who don't know me, I'm Miriam Bia. I am the president of ADHD Europe and I'm the how do you say, chief executive of the German association ADHS Deutschland. Moreover, I'm a lawyer and I'm pretty traveling around and telling people about their rights about ADHD. So what we have in Germany, uh, we have a patient rights law, we have problems regarding the job or your hobby, about traffic, about disability, about sports, especially with doping and travel and insurance. Now, let me see. In Germany, since 2013, we have a law and it uh, regulates the relation between the professional and the patient. And what's very important, uh, it's the first time they put a communication in a law. So there's a lot of information duties for professionals, not only in regard on the real treatment, but they have to inform about everything which is important around having a certain condition or illness. And they have to do a proper documentation Otherwise, they can be held liable, and this gives more rights in general to patients, and I think that's helpful. This is in German. The guy comes out of the doctor's office, and the one guy says, so what about the diagnosis? And the other one says something about attention deficit, but I didn't listen closely. And I think that's also a big problem, not only in Germany, that people 
don't listen and communication is a big issue, especially with doctors. So I think it's a good thing to have a law now where it says the doctor has not only to inform and explain, but also to documentate things. Now regarding ADHD, uh, lucky in the Netherlands, in Germany, it's still a big stigma. And when you go to employers, usually they don't like to hear that you have ADHD or something like that. So like Hans said, if you don't tell, you can't get advantages. But so far in Germany, it's better not to tell. And in fact, you don't have to tell. Of course, if you think you need whatever help, it's good to tell. Otherwise, you can't ask for uh, useful or reasonable adjustments. But as long as you don't want to tell, you don't have to tell. And uh, the only question employers in Germany can ask is, are you capable to do this work? And as long as you think you are capable to do the job, you don't have to tell about your ADHD and about medication. It's a little bit different if you want to work for the state as an official, there you have to disclose everything, but it's a decision on a case by case basis. So it's not okay to say we don't want you because you have ADHD. They have to explicitly say, because you are blah, 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 blah. We don't think you can work as normal person as the end for your, to your retirement. Otherwise they have to take you. And that's the same for everything else. It's the same for army and police, but in reality, the police and the army don't really care. They do what they want and it's hard, you know, because you have to go to court and sue them if they don't take you for a job. I don't know about other countries, but to become a pilot with Lufthansa or whatever big company is not possible because they say if you have ADHD and more severe, you take medication, you are not capable to do the job. And that's also decision one by one. You could sue them, but so far nobody really did. Driving in Germany, we have a law, and uh, in this law it says um, this condition or that condition uh, doesn't give you the general aptitude to drive a car, but they don't list ADHD, they don't list really the medication. So, in the end, your aptitude or you're capable to drive a car with ADHD and even with your medication and you don't have to tell. But in reality, when you come into a police control, they handle it differently. And the police says, oh, you take legal drugs. And if you take legal drugs, you take also non-legal drugs. And they try, you know, to give you a hassle and a problem. So even the law is different and you're allowed to drive, better not to be in a police control because that could be different. I had no time to translate that. That's about disability. And I think it's pretty much the same they have in the Netherlands regarding what is a disability. And when you ask uh, yourself is ADHD and or autism a disability in regard of the law, we have a list and there is a point 351. It talks about autism and with autism, you can be disabled from zero to 100%. And then three. Five two talks about ADHD, and it says when you are under 25, usually you can get everything between zero and 100, and afterwards it's less than being severely disabled. So the problem for an adult with ADHD, usually in Germany, they are not disabled in the sense of the law. So they can't ask for compensation uh, in all regards because they are not disabled. Then all the small other things uh, you may know when you take methylphenidate or amphetamine that's regarded as a doping stuff. So when you're going for whatever sports thing, you have to ask the international anti-doping WADA uh, for extra permission to perform. And at the Olympics, you are not allowed to take anything like methylphenidate or amphetamine. When you travel with this medication, when you're in the Schengen round, so it's EU more or less, there's a special form in Germany, the doctor has to fill out and you have to go to authorities, pay some money, and then you can travel. Be aware, Great Britain left the EU. So if you are traveling to the, to the island, to Great Britain, you have to have extra paperwork 
and you have to have two different papers if you go by car from Germany because you pass by the Netherlands or Belgium and if you fly it's only one and I really tell people in Germany if they go abroad to countries like Thailand or other countries with severe drug laws rather contact before the embassy to figure out what you need and regarding insurance it's the same like in the Netherlands. The insurance companies are free to conclude a contract or deny. And like Hans said, uh, it's not discriminating if you say there's a certain reason uh, with more risk. And in Germany, they say with ADHD, you are more prone to have accidents. And they take all the nice studies we have regarding untreated ADHD, and they use that as a reason to take higher insurance uh, fees or just to deny. So that's something I think we really can work on on the EU level because like Hans said, uh, it's not a real thing to say ADHD is really a reason not to give you an insurance. So that was a fast run to Germany to give you an idea what things you can talk about. And I think now we are interested what's going on in other countries and to make it a little bit more, you know, easy, I would go and start with the things we addressed already and say, so what do you say about this and that? And we go through the different types of possible discrimination and problems. And then we come to subjects we didn't mention and you can tell us because I learned that Iceland has some problems I never heard of before. So I think there are maybe some things you would like to share with us where we had no clue that you can have discrimination. So I think it's pretty easy maybe to start with driving and ADHD. Is there a country around here? Please put your cameras on. That's easier to see you then, especially when we're talking to each other and we are only 20, so we can see each other. So, we have problems in Germany, even we have the right laws. I know we are having problems in the north. Maybe you want to share your experience with driving with ADHD and or medication. I see Letizia shared with us in the chat. I know about a case about amphetamine medication, driving a car and problem with the car insurance. No, in, not insured. So that's not good. Looking around, no problems in other countries with driving and ADHD. And we have to move. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, hello, prop uh, hello? hello, sorry, <laughs> just an intervention. I know that uh, in Italy, if uh, the methylphenidate, met uh, Ritalin is included in something that is, uh, is supposed not to allow you to drive, but uh, it really is, uh, the law is not enforced. So it's uh, kind of nobody has been uh, prohibited to drive from the before they take uh, this medication. Oh. At least uh, they told me. And about dexamphetamine, do you know that, uh, Daniele? In Italy, only Ritalin and another principle, the amphetamine are not allowed, are not prescribable. So ah. it's not, uh, there is a very poor choice of uh, drug related to ADHD. Oh, okay. okay. So no medication, then no problem with driving, but you can't receive the medication that's even worse. Yeah, these, uh, in Italy, the choice is only, and it's very difficult to be prescribed uh, if you are an adult uh, that is, uh, has not been diagnosticated when you were uh, under, uh, when you are a teenager. If you are an adult uh, diagnosticated, uh, uh, it's very, very, very difficult to be uh, to obtain prescription. Uh, there is not a real uh, awareness about about this problem. Uh, you need to have uh, a specialized center uh, that uh, prescribe this kind of drugs, uh, or you can go some kind of private uh, uh, doctor 
but it is, and also if you have to pay for it, you can uh, even if it's prescribed, you can't uh, uh, you can you can you can uh, just pay you just be have a free of charge on the national health system. Okay. Yeah, what, what the problem is with uh, medication and driving is that when you were, were really thinking of argumentations why medication is so good for ADHD and driving, then you have to tell around that people with ADHD without medication cannot drive because they make too much accident. And nobody's going to say that in the open. So it's a bit hard to promote medication for driving because when you promote it, you will, you will use argumentations that include that without medication, the driving isn't, well, at least not so good. So that's a bit of a, a double bind we have around medication and driving. And uh, anyways, uh, Rob Pereira, we do have experience with uh, dexamphetamine and driving in the Netherlands. Is it going a bit better already or are we still uh, in the misere? No, it's not going better, but <clears throat> um, in practice, there are not very many problems. So if you take a normal dose of your dexamphetamine and you have a prescription with you and you make no accidents, uh, then it's okay, but if you have an accident, for example, they can uh, check your um, uh, drugs uh, with, um, um, with, a, with a test with saliva. <clears throat> and when it's possible, when it's um, present, they have to measure it in your blood, and then they say it's more or less than 50 milligrams per, per liter, and that's okay or not okay. <clears throat> but actually, that's not the real. Uh, it's not a real border. Leticia has some experience. There, yeah, it's true, but I'm just um, telling you uh, something else. The 50 milligram is a mistake. It's a big mistake. Of it's whom? about 50 micrograms okay. per liter. In your blood? In your blood. Oh, okay. 50 microgram, yeah, you're right. Yeah. And it makes a big difference because there is uh, no chance that when you use this um, medication, you will and you will be tested. You never get under the what we call border uh, value. Never. It's the border value of we t we uh, tell it uh, grenswaarde is made. So that they only can find it in your blood. If they can find it, you're at the wrong side of the of the border. threshold of the threshold. Yes. No, we are, we are going to test it uh, in the, in the near future with some people who have uh, ADHD and dexamphetamine, and then we can test it beforehand because not everybody is going over this 50 microgram uh, border. Yep. Okay. No. That's better in Germany because they, they really, when they test somebody, they really exactly look what's in the blood and if it's, you know, matching uh, the prescription and as long as it's matching, it's fine. But unfortunately, a lot of people think it's a good idea to put a little bit, you know, different things also into your the bodies and yeah. moreover, sometimes don't take it exactly as prescribed but think it's better to use some more or in a different way mm -hmm. and then it's not matching and then you have big trouble but there's no linear no, no linear um uh, uh, correlation <laughs> a correlation between the dose and um, the blood level so that's yeah, always the, the problem it's not linear I have no clue. I'm not a m medical doctor, so. But for, as far as I got to know, it's not a problem if you take a medication the way you should take it, so it, as it's prescribed, because they know how to to figure that out with the blood. But the problem is really if somebody is not, you know, really sticking to the prescription. 
Mm-hmm. Because in Germany, it's legal in the end if you take it as prescribed. But uh, as in the minute you take something else, no matter if it's some more mass of any date or a little bit else or even alcohol, then it's it's going to be a problem. Or cannabis, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if we are, we have no other people who can share stories, I would go ahead with a different subject. Yes, please. Uh, sorry, just, just one thing. Oh. I, I just wanted to, to tell you that maybe you know already, but uh, I know that in Canada, for example, um, people who, who are the, the diagnosed with ADHD uh, must have uh, during their driving uh, the, the medicine uh, if they are, uh, I mean, if they are blocked by a policeman and they, they, they didn't have um, taken the medicine, um, uh, I mean, you cannot drive when you, when you, when you are uh, diagnosed, you cannot drive without taking medicine in Canada. So it is exactly the, the, the contrary. Yeah. <laughs> What we have in our in our Europe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering, but you know, when you go for diagnosis, do you only get the diagnosis if you also need medication, or what does the professional say? Because you know, it makes no sense to get a diagnosis, but it's not severe enough uh, to take medication, and you know, then people would not go for a diagnosis because they have to fear that they have to take medication even they don't need it. That's an interesting question. Yeah, sure. It's very complicated. We have someone in from Australia, Paul Schwert. Maybe when you feel up to it, you can share the Australian situation with us. If that's... Uh... Paul? Yeah. Yes, good morning. Um... <laughs> Well, we, that's that's your your country is morning. We are in the upside evening down. Now. <laughs> yeah. No problem. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, we have uh, different laws and regulations for each state or province, um, and um, th- there is no policy, law, or regulation other than uh, if medication is prescribed and taken correctly. Um, there is no actual enforcement unless the blood levels are high. Hmm. Okay. But it's okay. but it is a problem here in Australia. Then what is the problem? Uh, uncertainty in law and regulation. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's well. It's it looks like Europe. <laughs> And we have different countries with different different regulations, so well, it's it's complicated to uh, make an inventory of how is the regulation in all these countries. So, well, hopefully we do have a European regulation where I pointed at about uh, uh, medication uh, and uh, making propaganda for it. So, yeah, maybe another sub- subject, Miriam. Yes, I think we maybe can all agree on the insurance issue. Is there a country without any problems to get a, how do you call it, life uh, insurance or a work disability insurance? Because I think that's pretty, it was it's similar for Germany and the Netherlands, and I would assume it's the same in other countries. Does anybody know of people who are refused based on their ADHD? In the Netherlands, it did happen, just bluntly, in your face, check ADHD on your registration form and, sorry, we don't accept you. So we were protesting against it and, well, we'll we'll, we'll try to sue them, but it takes time. Well, then I assume we will check. Yeah, Pavlina. Hi, everyone. I would uh, I would share my um, personal experience for my son, which is thirteen, and I was suggested to make a life life insurance. So the lawyer said, "Do not mention at all 
if you just mention any disability that he has, uh, uh, my name is Bulgarian, but I am living in Italy. Oh. So I had to, I didn't say anything to make an insurance for the guy. This is my experience that I wanted to share with you. But yeah. the problem, at least in Germany, is if you don't tell the truth, you know, they ask you about oh, your exactly, history. Exactly, exactly. So I, I didn't, so I have all the papers by the authority now for his uh, condition, but I couldn't share the documents with the insurance company because there is no law, there is no reg regulation, and uh, the guy is at school, in a mid-school, so that means uh, accidents happen very often at home uh, also. Yeah. And this is a big problem, yeah. not telling the truth. Yes, and like in Germany, I know a case where somebody didn't tell the insurance, but they got to know about it and he was sued in court for fraud because he didn't tell the truth. And then you are not only losing, you know, what you paid for the insurance, but also I'm you have- I'm frightened the, about that situation. Yeah. Yes, I'm frightened about that situation. So I'm thinking about renewing what I would say, what I should do, because now I'm more informed uh, with our situation here in Italy. So the situation is not clear. It's just not yeah. clear. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pavlina. Rob. Uh, we had um, <clears throat> recently we had a case of a person who had ADHD, but he outgrew it, and still the company didn't want him to to be a member of their insurance. And then we uh, de ADHD'd him, so we deleted the diagnosis uh, officially, and then uh, he could have his insurance. Oh. So you can do something like that because in Germany, yeah, they asked you for the five to 10 years which passed. So if in case you had the diagnosis in between the last five or 10 years, you have to tell them. Yeah, and then you can also uh, take the diagnosis away if you don't uh, have any disabilities anymore. Yeah, if you don't have any functioning problems, you may have it in your genes, but it's not ADHD. But then in Germany, yeah. you really have to wait then five years before you know you can apply without telling them. Even if you know if you are not in in treatment or seeing okay. a doctor anymore, you have to wait the five years. So, mm -hmm. okay. Also, this is, uh, as we notice now, a, a very complicated legal uh, legal problem. And so we are happy that we have started. Well, we are still starting it up, but with a. Uh, a legal committee within HSD Europe that can sort of study or make an inventory or at least pass on experiences, hopefully good practices where, where people succeeded. And we might even in the future find uh, fundings to go to the European uh, court if there is a real good case, but you know that's very expensive and complicated. But at least we have this small committee who uh, from a few members of ADSD Europe who try to to dig into all kinds of legal stuff. Oh, good stuff. Yeah. Also, uh, with my sons, I made the experience uh, that in one case, uh, he had a diagnosis when he was uh, six or seven. And when uh, he had passed his uh, education uh, with success, the insurance said, okay, it, it doesn't bother us anymore. And with the other son who has more problems, uh, he got an, uh, some kind of insurance. They said they, he would get an insurance because he had also finished an education, but uh, everything which is concerning to psychological problems is excluded. So it makes no sense. Yeah, and it's the, the the theoretical nice thing is you can of course do a deal with an insurance. You can try to pay more or get exemptions, but in the end they always want to earn money and they are not interested in personal stories. And no matter if you have cancer or ADHD or anything else in Germany, when you have something chronic, uh, they try not to to insure you and find a lot of 
good or bad reasons in studies and say, see, the risk is bigger, therefore we need more money or we don't even take you at all. But I, I, I think it was interesting where that insurance are looking for if somebody has an, a completed education. Yeah. That's uh, for, for them, it's imp uh, important. Yeah, sure. Uh, that, you know, it's 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 quite complicated because when you happen to be working in an insurance company, you're going to calculate and then you say, well, we, we have to earn money, we can't go broke, we have to pay all these claims and then they calculate hmm, ADSD is a risk. Okay, don't do ADSD. So in itself, it sounds reasonable, but in the end, when you talk about with an insurer and who first excludes all the risks, then there's no risk, so there's no insurance. So in fact, it's stupid, but it, it sounds reasonable, but it isn't. And that's because insurers are more and more commercial companies and not like in the old days, a collective working together for people who help each other when there's a problem. So not no solidarity. It's, it's, there's no solidarity at all and that's the, the new development is i don't know if any other countries know it the new development it's yeah i only know the dutch word broodfondse so uh, uh people who organize an, uh, an insurance themselves amongst each other as soon as you have a thousand people you can put money in this uh, budget in this fund and then you are a sort of an insurance and they call it, uh, let's say, a, a working fund, a, a bread fund. So that when something happens to you, you at least have bread to eat. So that's why the name bread fund. And uh, that will be the future, that insurers who are only commercial and exclude any risk and then let you pay for no risk, that's a bit, well, weird, you know? And uh, in the Netherlands, we are talking with the, the union of insurers to convince them that they are well they're not okay let's say yeah from from a human rights pers perspective important subject work in progress and in fact Hans, i think that's good to go to the next subject you already mentioned uh, talking about adhd work and disability because i think that's a huge difference i think stigma we have everywhere in the european union nobody should take a sheet of paper says i have adhd do you want uh, me as an employee i don't think so far a lot of them from the employers are uh, thrilled to take people with adhd but about legal rights what's about disability is adhd for adults recognized in your countries as a disability i'm sure in italy it's not because <laughs> no, but I, I do remember from Italy, I don't know if Monica knows that, in Italy, the, the dyslexia uh, network succeeded to get dyslexia recognized in the law as a disability. Legally, that's a bit stupid to put all disabilities in the law. Uh, there is a, yeah, there is do you know it from Italy? Yeah, for dyslexia, uh, which is with the dyslexia with the other the other disabilities of um, autism uh, no yeah autism but also there is a you know a, a, for math so this dyspraxia what's the name no dyscalculia dyscalculia that was the one this yeah, takes exactly, yeah but with the other ones uh, uh, on, on the sides uh, so we we have a, a low in italy for those but because for adhd we don't have nothing we don't have uh, so uh, we don't have nothing that can help us to uh, to be covered. Uh, in, in so uh, if you apply for a job, you, you normally you don't say I am a an, a, 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 a HD diagnosis. So it, it's better to to hide. <laughs> in other can, in our country, some people say dyslexia is an ability. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Coming back to ADHD, Carola, you wanted to say something. 
please unmute yourself, Carola Siegel. Okay, now? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm from Austria. Here, uh, adults, uh, severe cases can, can get a degree of disability, but usually it's too, too small to serve for anything. Only thing you can do is uh, when you apply for a job that you tell about your degree of disability and, and um, say that, that so your boss can, can get help from the state because he, um, he takes a, dis a disabled person. But usually uh, um, having a degree of disability is a disadvantage unless you have more than 50 degrees. And you get some 20 or 30 with ADHD, even, even if you have severe problems in everyday life. Thanks, Carola. In, how's, how's Greece about the uh, disability uh, side, Christina? Yes. Uh, there are some provisions in the um, uh, in law that um, employers they get um, some uh, aid or some bonuses when they employ people with uh, certain disabilities. I don't know if ADHD is within these uh, disabilities. But uh, certainly it is recognized in, um, up to the age of 18 as a disability and the state uh, offers uh, extra um, helping hand to parents with children with ADHD. Uh, they, they offer a supportive uh, education, somebody to assist the child into their uh, learning into their staying at uh, in the classroom and uh, they also found some um, uh, some um, in the afternoons they go to special uh, centers uh, for dyslexia or dyscalculia or all these uh, difficulties uh, the children to be helped and cope with it uh, now uh, i don't know something more uh, uh, to tell you for sure. I'm not very certain in my answer, so I would opt to refrain for something that might be so or not so. What about stigma? Despite a uh, talk about the disability, at least in Germany, we encounter it's a lot of stigma when you tell employees, oh, we, I have ADHD, something like that. Is there any country where you would say, oh, like Hans said, it's, it's also uh, ability and uh, strength and companies who appreciate to get people with the strength or in your country, like in Germany, it's better not to tell people. Letizia. I don't have any ideas about this. So I mute again. <laughs> Here in Greece, it is a, a debate between ADHDers whether they should uh, reveal and inform the employers of their ADHD or not. And uh, there is not uh, a concrete policy regarding this. It is a, a jacked, uh, how we say this knife with uh, the double blade. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. sure. But, um... I would like to, to, to mention something. Um, that you said, Hans, uh, previously regarding the insurance companies. Uh, I totally agree with what you said, that um, there is no solidarity and it is um, uh, more a commercial business. 
And uh, we can, uh, the proof of that is that uh, you can see that almost all uh, insurance companies, they have unified more or less their clauses. Yep. So there are no very audacious uh, uh, insurance companies that they would go out of the box and yep. leave the safety of uh, the steady income of the premiums. Yeah, sure. But in, in, in time, people will take matters into their own hands. And uh, consumers are more and more uh, being uh, like, uh, well, uh, going for their rights and organizing things themselves. By the way, I think what Paul Wert from Australia said, please, can you uh, say it aloud, Paul? Uh, because that's interesting the conflict between destigmatization and getting recognized as a disability. That's a bit of a, well, a kind of conflict. Uh, yes, Hans, uh, you've, you've said it very well there. Uh, ADHD in Australia was removed from the Disability Discrimination Act about eight years ago, um, but all other Dis disabilities have been retained in the Act. Why was it removed? Um, I can't tell you for certain, but I've been told it was in an attempt to destigmatize ADHD, um, and therefore it had an unintended consequence. Yeah. And therefore today we are trying to reinstate ADHD or the impairment of ADHD back into the act. So there was that conflict. Yep, so sure. unintended, con uh, good, good meaning, well-meaning actions can have unintended consequences. Yep. I think that's it's, interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. And that's exactly the conflict. So thank you for sharing this with us, because this, uh, this uh, being it a stigma, uh, let me take you back to what I quoted the definition of, uh, let me take you back to that. The, the definition of a person with a disability is those who have long-term physical, that's the brain, or mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments, which in interaction with various barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. This means that it's not very wise to get certain diagnosis in the legislation. I think it's better. This is really about the legal side of constructing legislations uh, to put the general definition, which is already in the UN a treaty, of a disability, so that's a disability. So if you have ADHD or ABC or XYZ, if you are a person with a physical or mental, et cetera, et cetera, uh, uh, problem, like I just quoted, then it is a disability. If you can prove that with a doctor and a psychiatrist and maybe your employer or whatever, then you can go to the European Court of Justice where the, the, the breach of human rights are handled. I know that's very complicated, costs a lot of money, but may you perhaps meet a rich family with a son with ADHD and he is discriminated, ask the father, hey man, let's go to court, let's have fun and go to, uh, what is it, Strasbourg. <laughs> I can't, like you said, lawyers like to do that. Other people don't. Uh, yeah, I know, I know, that. of course. Anyhow, of course. Pavlina, you wanted to say something. Thank you. I just wanted to share another experience here in one of the regions uh, in Italy. I know adults that has disability uh, recognition with the comorbidities, with the dif uh, differences of the a separate, um, um, how do you say, with a difference, uh, differences of the diagnosis, like uh, anxious or bipolar or 
uh, depression. So they have they have recognition for those, but they have to don't say or not saying about the, uh, they cannot speak about ADHD. Oh, yeah. Because because as um, Paul I think um, was his name said the stigma is everywhere. Basically, you grow up and you don't have clear ADHD, you become something else, no? You, you, you develop, you, you mutate, you... Uh, this is according to some of the psychiatrists, no? For adults. Uh, I personally know people with uh, disability, <clears throat> with a comorbid comorbidities, but no, because of the ADHD. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. By the way, I see that Villiel Moore Hel Marson, <laughs> sorry if I pronounce it right, is in the room. So the president of the Icelandic Association, am I right? Filial Moor, are you there? Oh, I see uh, VH, so. Well, let's maybe go on and he jumps on the next subject because I think we went through the pretty much common things like jobs, driving, insurance and disability. Now it's up to you to tell us what else in your countries is maybe causing problems uh, we didn't mention before because I think what we mentioned it's very pretty common in all countries more or less. It's more recognized in the Netherlands and in Germany than in Italy or in Greece. Uh, but we are facing in different degrees all the same problems, stigmatization and discrimination. But I think as far as I know, there are still some other issues in some countries. So I would like to jump on that one. Or maybe we get some ideas about that in Australia with Paul. Um, I, I I think we are suffering uh, similar issues that you in Europe are also suffering. Um, but I have to admit that there is uh, the, uh, quite a, a difference in our legislation and in our laws. We are based on common law and in Europe you are based on uh, civil law so that provides uh, does not provide a good comparison in terms of legislation okay now I see Wilhelm you uh, sorry <laughs> I work on your name but you joined us and you know we, we worked through the common uh, subjects I don't know uh, if you could listen already so we talked about driving we talked about uh, the workplace, we talked about insurance, a little bit doping and traveling. But as I understood when talking to Hannah when I met him, you have some more issues in Iceland. I was very surprised to hear, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that, that when you have ADHD, you have problems to um, to go and, and give, how do you call that, um, eggs or uh, to, to f for fertilization for other people when you have ADHD. Is that true? Please unmute, uh, Philia Moore. Now you can hear me. Yeah. Ah, sorry about that. Sorry about the problems. Uh, somebody else is connecting on uh, my device next door <laughs> that's what you saw earlier and kept stealing my bluetooth headphones um yes we have seen uh well we got sent a case uh, regarding uh egg donor sort of a sort of a this sort of fertilizer center and uh, apparently you're not allowed to donate an egg if you have hcac we've only just started to look into it so we'll have to wait and see Apart from that, yes, we have the similar problems like with uh, driving. <clears throat> it's not such a big problem anymore with uh, with um, 
metal vent that. So retailing concept, etc. As long as there's nothing else in the case, and as long as the person uh, is is tested with what is to be expected of the dose for that day, it will not re usually not reach the ports. But we are seeing an influx regarding uh, elements and attending. So both both uh, base themselves on uh, on uh, <clears throat> oh, what are you called? <laughs> Amphetamine substance. Um, Probably the biggest case we, we've sort of turned around was the uh, police academy. So uh, we, of course, don't have an army, but I'd say about four years ago, the police academy here was sort of changing their rules very oddly. And, and after the first year, before the cadets could go to, to uh, um, be trained on the grounds, after one year of study, they were suddenly being disqualified even if they just had an HDHD diagnose. Now, we managed to sort of change that, but a year later, they came out with new rules, which were even worse. So what we did, rather than just shouting out loud in, in media, we also went in, uh, spoke to them, and we came to the consensus that we explained to them that HDHD as such is not really the problem, but if you see some uh, behavioral disorders, and stuff that's a more more likely sort of thing to to uh, to to look for rather than HCHD or just HCHD. Um, at that time, they were said they were basing their uh, new rules on the regulations in Scandinavia, mostly Nor Norwegians, so both army and and, and, and police, but a mixture of them all, and that supposedly was based on some scientific academic research. We never saw those research papers. We just kept asking. Uh, eventually, by joining up with them, by, by sending in people, uh, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, we sort of turned the case. Um, they needed another sort of push about a year ago. But what I'm told now, I haven't got it confirmed. I'm actually told that the Scandinavian authorities are now looking towards how we are doing it in Iceland. So it might mean change their nature. Oh. That's quite something. Yeah. Yeah. It took a few years. Took a few years, yeah. So, but but maybe others can profit from your experience yeah. and your what you achieved. That would be wonderful most, as most definitely. But so maybe that's an idea to to organize as ADC Europe models of good practice and share them with the world or amongst each other. Uh, we'll, we'll make a note of that. Models of good practice is, a, is an accepted way of, of organizing. It, it's work because you have to describe the problem and what did you do, etc. Yeah. But in two pager about what did, in this case, Iceland do? What was the problem? How did you succeed? It would be wonderful to share it. I think so. Yeah, and, and they're, all, they're also, uh, you know, insanely simple things like the fact that you know, during the last two years, the uh, the um, police academy has been moved to a uh, uh, university up north. So most of the learning, specifically for the first year, is distant learning. That also meant that the teachers and the people around the school didn't meet the students, at least not on, on, on regular grounds. So they had less information to base their uh, evaluation on. And then, you know, just, just to point out those simple things. Yeah. And as for the, <clears throat> as for the uh, driving and stuff, we know, I mean, I speak to a lot of police people specifically regarding well-known methodologies. We know most, most police people are knowledgeable about this, but, but less knowledgeable, knowledgeable about the new, uh, new uh, medication like elements and, and and uh, what is it called? Attending. Uh, but they are willing to work with us. Maybe they can't do it in public, but we are actually going to sort of go a side way. There is a sort of, um, what do you call it? Uh, the, the travel committee that sort of handles all kinds of, of public announcements. They are going to work with us and the police to create some, some uh, information booklets. And that's definitely something we can then pass on. Oh, great. Maybe if you find somewhere in the network of the police uh, 
authorities, uh, mm -hmm. management. We can do a webinar on that. Interview them, how they see it and how they mm -hmm. how they developed their their opinion about it, etc. That would mm -hmm. be wonderful. And you could be anonymous, so nobody has to. I think it's still yeah. a problem, maybe, to be there in person with your name on it. But if somebody wants to be hit behind the screen, we yeah. would also appreciate that and take somebody yeah. for a webinar. Yeah, sure. We might, we might actually need to do it via the, the traffic authority. Um, yeah. Because in public, uh, policemen, specifically high up, are, are very sort of wary or aware of sort of not saying things too clearly because they, they you know, it's, a, it's a legal yeah. matter. It has to be correct. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Sure. But, anyways. Yeah, it, it, it could get organized. Once we have something, yeah, you're just making me enthusiastic about it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Don't run too fast, okay? Step by step. I know, I well, know. <laughs> you can, you can maybe, maybe do it sooner on the on the police academy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. And, uh, Daniel, did you raise your hand? You disappeared now in the dark of Italy. <laughs> We can't hear you. Danielle, can you hear us? No. He's working on his phone. <clears throat> can you ah. hear me? Ah. Yes, okay. now, now we can. Okay, no, just um, the the end, the raise the end was a mistake. Uh, I think that uh, I am not uh, enough uh, experience uh, as uh, ADHD. As, first of all, as Can you speak a little bit louder, please? It's very, very like far away. Uh, sorry, I say that uh, I was saying I am uh, not have enough experience uh, with uh, HIFA, so I can give any official uh, in, um, opinion about the problem that we are facing. But one thing that uh, I think that as especially as concern people uh, with HD adults, uh, I think that uh, the main problem is that is not really a knowledge, is not really known. So there is maybe less discrimination because nobody <laughs> knows about it even though people can have a significant problem in their daily life. Mm -hmm. But I think now we have a big problem of awareness, even in authorities, uh, doctors, uh, uh, in, uh, even Diane, as uh, the other person of the committee was saying, uh, there is a big problem of uh, how to be diagnosticated by a doctor, even a, psych a psychiatrist, uh, is not a Sometimes it doesn't really know about ADHD, even there is a lot of information about it. Mm -hmm. I think there are kind of slightly different problem because of uh, this fact. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I say, I mean, one thing that benefits us over here, I mean, I got my diagnosis 21 years ago. Um, I came on board with the AIDS Data Society 10 years ago. At that time, that we were starting to uh, just, it was a 20 year plan, and we have the way through to, to make the, the subject known, to make people understand what's going on. And we are actually, we are actually uh, getting a lot of feedback now after 10 years. So we have a lot of visibility as an as a, uh, association. Um, and, and this, those things to change the, the, the discourse, to change the discussions, just takes a lot of time. And, and you always start here with yourself. Uh, I've got ADHD, there's nothing wrong with my brain. It just works this way, not the other way. And then carry on talking about it, positive waves, etc. And it just takes a lot of time. Definitely true, yes. You know, we have the subject now in Germany for 40 years. We started as, you know, only children had ADHD yeah. and it was gone by 18. 
that was a fund because was 18 no health insurance paid for the medication because i said it's disappearing when you turn 18 and it took us i think 10 years to convince them of course together with the pharmaceutical companies who asked for for the reimbursement um to convince insurance to pay for it so now we are i think pretty good in germany having different medication paid by public yeah. health insurance and i know like italy there is nearly it's nothing needed. same in france so oh. it's a long way and yes. i think that's the reason to meet here and and exchange information and like hans said we should really collect best practice and also tell people where they should be aware and so i think that's kind of a start this evening to to start with exchanging and collecting information and go on with a small subgroup to proceed further with this um, uh, uh, Miriam, I just asked Carola from Malta if there is an update from Malta about legal matters, maybe a short one about discrimination, insurance problems or whatever that you know of. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, well, actually, I'd just like to mention again that the uh, the insurance systems are so different in all the different countries in all the European area. Um, because here we don't have a compulsory um, insurance that, that we need to pay. So it goes automatically from your taxes. And so um, with the health insurance, really most people for um, ADHD, especially youths and then adults are a bit more wishy-washy they they get their complete medication uh refunded by the government system they don't need to pay anything not even to the pharmacy um and only to the doctor if they go get a private prescription so that is something that is a bit different compared to uh i think the netherlands and other places um and therefore we don't really have private health insurance. You mainly get that if you're a foreigner working for, you know, a, a bigger company. And then, like for instance, my, my husband works in the hotel industry, so he was offered an insurance. And then you have to declare your, um, your illnesses and they automatically exclude them. So it's a very different system from abroad. So if you actually admit to having a some kind of a diagnosis in my case i have problems with my thyroid that is automatically completely excluded and you were never going to get any refund for any medication anyway so very different system then considering other insurances it's not very popular here like my uh, in holland i know i would have uh, like an indemnity insurance in case i bump into someone even if it's on the road it's very cheap <laughs> um here we we don't use it but when we as a voluntary organization host events where there are children with adhd we ask insurance companies to either sponsor us or to give us some competitive quotes um, and those sums are normally a bit like, my gosh, just for an event to have this kind of insurance. But we all know that ADHD kids are a bit more accident prone. So we like to have something to cover us. Um, at the moment, regarding legislation, I looked into the driving license situation and medication and driving license. I think here, as long as you just don't mention it, you're okay. And if you do get into an accident and you can show that you were taking this medication and it was prescribed to you, you shouldn't have a major problem, but you should not go offering these details as you apply to get your driving license. So it is a matter of like the other lady was saying, like maybe you should just hush and only if you have to show the evidence. And if you can prove that it was taken according to prescription, you'll be all right, fingers crossed. Um, and then of course, another big difference is that we only have very few medications here in Malta being a small island. So when I hear the names of um, other non-stimulants and, and things that are related to amphetamines, we don't even have those on the island. So there's a big lack of 
uh, experience with that and therefore no legislation regarding that. But I dread the day that we have somebody from Iceland, Sweden, who has taken their own medication with them, who gets involved in, for instance, a traffic accident while on some of these medications, and then we will have a media spectacle because then it falls outside of the usual thing. What I heard today that my colleagues were busy with were uh, discussing with the medical department um, the rights of patients to have access to more medication. So I feel that for us, that is somewhere legally that we are trying to uh, stand up for our rights. We are kind of considered as a disability, but we're normally just abandoned by everybody, including the dyslexia group. They just put all like, oh, yeah, ADHD. It's similar to dyslexia, isn't it? Yeah. And that's it. We, we hardly do anything together. It's unfortunate. Anyway, that's a little update from Malta. Thank you. Thank you, Corona. Well, anything else? Wilhelm, I'm sorry, I will learn your name, someone. Wilhelm, do you want to add something because you put up your hand? Originally put on my hand because we noticed that Facebook was down in Iceland. Uh, I believe that is quite sort of system wide, probably in Europe. So a lot of people uh, try to watch this on Facebook, or whatever, can't. But regarding what uh, Ursula was saying, um, <clears throat> if you look at the insurance companies and you don't tell, and this something happens and that does pop up, you actually sort of invalidate your, your insurance. If you're, uh, if the police stops you, and if they see some reason to actually do a blood test or whatever, and this kind of uh, medicational drugs pop up. Uh, you may be in, in, in worse situations than before. However, as, as things are supposed to be handled uh, here, you should not need to have a doctor's letter or let alone the official, uh, official document that, that says that I am allowed to get this medication and it's being subsidized by the state. And nobody should be walking around with that in their pockets. And then a police investigation has to be formally asked for and entered. Those those things take time. Um, something else you said there? No, I can't remember. No, it's comes, gone. Comes back this night when you're in bed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, Anything if... else somebody would like to address? Ah, traveling medication. Yeah, we talked about that, Corolla, before you popped in. I said, uh, uh, and uh, I told everybody, you know, remember, Great Britain is not EU anymore. So <laughs> I had the case in Germany. I told somebody, you need different paperwork now, and you need the old paperwork to, if you pass through the other countries and then enter in Great Britain, you need yeah. something else. So yes, yeah. and of oh, course, um, not EU. Yeah. I'm, I'm not just read yesterday that Icelandic students going to UK, they have to insure themselves for something like 1,500 euros. But uh, traveling with uh, medication, as long as the country that you, you're entering doesn't forbid them completely, it shouldn't be a huge problem. But the biggest obstacle is actually uh, international laws on flights. Because if you read them and if you uh, interpret them very strictly, you could say that you could, you're allowed to have medication with you that lasts the flight, not the total traveling time. So there are a lot of pitfalls there. I think it's always good to check, especially when you go to countries with strict mm. laws regarding no. drugs and else, because otherwise you may end someplace else than in your hotel and not the beach. So that's mm. always, and you should really consider if you need medication when going on vacation. And what we also said, you know, we are connected very well. Sometimes it's easier to get only a letter from your doctor with a diagnosis and treatment, but no medication and you travel and then you find a doctor in the country. You figure that out sometimes with South or Middle America, that's easier. And of course, in the USA, it's, it's the easiest way to go to a doctor there instead of trying to bring your medication over, so. If you don't mind, I'll jump in with one more thing, because recently we had an exchange student from the Netherlands come over 
And um, Dr. Rob told me about uh, this young lady. And I straight away said, listen here, things are organized differently. If she's going to be wanting ADHD medication, she has to bring it with her for the whole duration, whether it's two months or six months, which I think they do provide in the Netherlands. I don't know if for ADHD medication per se as a com six months ahead, um, but it would have been so hard for her to be able to access any local ADHD medication and I think this is something we still really have to work on within Europe, between our countries, something like cross-border prescriptions, I was calling it, mm -hmm. because it makes it so hard for us. How could we, if we're exchange students or students abroad for yeah. a year, how do sure. we cater for these people? And we want to be Europeans. We have to have a system that can exchange uh, medication as well. Yeah, sure. I think I think uh, us for students, as long as you're within the EU or the economy zone, what happens is that you, sh you should never have to take you know six months uh, of medication with you. What should happen is that within a month or two, as a student, you are sort of allowed into that country's health system, and that should take over. But that's not working very well, and and cross border uh, prescriptions, we have sort of changed the regulation about two years ago, and there are faults in it, for example, that they will not accept a prescription from a foreign doctor. Uh, a local doctor can actually look at it, prescribe it, but it'll have a special permission and you pay full price for it, regardless of, of being you know, insured within the EU or whatever. So there's a lot of strange things that, that, that should be similar in all those countries. But as long as we don't have this regulation, I think it's best to check in advance, which is, of course, a big problem when you have ADHD, because you do a lot of things last minute. I always tell people in Germany who think about going abroad for a longer time. The first thing before getting a flight, before getting accommodation, check on the medication. If you, you know, rather have to take it with you or find a way to, you know, to go back and forth. I lived in Hungary for a year. I drove to Germany. From, from time to time to get the medication for the children because you couldn't get anything in, in Hungary. And it's also interesting, um, in Denmark, you know, in the chat, um, it's Johanna wrote, in Denmark, doctors told me it might be a good idea to have my medicine card or my package from uh, Elvanza when driving a car. So if I would be stopped by the police, it would save me for some trouble because I could show them I was allowed to have amphetamine in the blood due to medication although it's not illegal for me to have documentation on me. Yes, I thought that would be the same in Germany, but we figured out the police rather says, oh, you take drugs, it's legal, but you also take illegal drugs. So rather, you know, don't talk about it, try to avoid any police controls. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I told people that's the best way. Yeah. You shouldn't have a mess ca a car, you know, when they look into your car and it looks like a trash bin, you are more prone to be asked for an alcohol test and else. Yeah. And even when they, you know, you don't have to permit them, you don't have to do the alcohol test, you don't have to do the drug test. Then they have to write a report that they think you are strange. Then they can take you to a doctor and then they can take the blood test. And usually they don't hassle in a normal control for that. So they say, oh, go away, go away. Uh, because otherwise you may get in trouble until, of course, you prove that everything is fine, but you're in the hassle of this whole system thing. And that's a problem. And we have laws, but the police is not interested that we have the laws. I think, you know, they are the police and it is more a German structural police problem than a legal problem. But anyhow. Okay, it's 9.30 German yep. President's time. I would like to share uh, uh, some information about the next uh, web webinars we are organizing. If you allow me, uh, Miriam. Yeah, uh, go ahead. This was today, and we loved it, didn't we, Miriam? It was of course. wonderful. Yeah. And then we have the next one that is Tuesday, the 12th. This is about science and it's vice versa how science can help you and how you can help science. So, typically, something for members of ADHD Europe with uh, uh, Dr. Jeanette Mostert from the University of Nijmegen and a PhD, Dana 
will be talking about all kinds of projects where we also participate in. Miriam knows a lot about that also. Then Wednesday the 20th, we have Dora and Sandra about uh, women and health and the upcoming survey they will talk about and all kinds of stuff. Also scientific news on uh, ADHD and women. By the way, for this one, you can use the link to, so next Tuesday at 1800 hours, you just can use the link you already used today. But for the 20th, you need to register and you will receive information. If you email us, we will send you the information because colleague Vilio will make a registration link. This will be a real webinar. This is a Zoom meeting today. But the, the number three and four are webinars. And the fourth will be Blandine French, who will be talking about the uh, toolbox that she made for it. it originally, it was for GPs, for uh, family doctors, but now for coaches and psychologists, a toolbox about treatment of ADHD. Very interesting. Please read the invitation. So this was the advertising for the other webinars thanks hans for taking care we have to apologize it's kind of a little bit bumpy start for the awareness months but due to say this usually unforeseen circumstances was somebody being ill and some other issues was like a little bit low cost but i really appreciate that so many people joined us and i think it was pretty interesting and it will be the start not the end uh, to look more into the different legal systems and problems in all our countries and uh, we already kind of formed an informal little subgroup but everybody who's interested in the subject feel free to contact us and say hey i would like to join and moreover i have to address for our members we will start another legal discussion about the uh, makeover of our statues you will get a mail about that soon so those of you who are eager to work on legal issues feel free there are things to come Hans, you want to say the last words? No, well, thank you very much, everybody. It's been a lot of work to prepare, but this makes my day. I'm very happy to have so much input from all countries, even from Australia. So yeah, that's, that's wonderful. That's Upside really, down. yeah, wonderful. So see you next week. Thank Perfect. you very much. Thanks, have a nice evening and you see you somewhere soon. Bye. Thanks Bye -bye. a lot. Thank you. Very, very Bye. interesting. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.